All right, Paul, it's good to talk to you. Listen, uh, when I put out the word that you and I were going to do a podcast, and we were going to talk about this subject, I asked people if they had any questions. And one of the questions that came to me, which is, seems a good a place as any to start, was tell me the places where the street versus sport isn't a fallacy. How would you answer that question? I would look at our, our priorities or our, uh, our hierarchy when we're dealing with a resisting opponent. So in sport, when we're dealing with the resisting opponent, kind of the, the boxes we need to check are, I need to control their hands. I can't let them have any kind of a grip on me. I can't let them establish any kind of control on me unanswered. So if I grab you know, your lapel, or if I grab, you know, your sleeve, you have to answer that immediately. Otherwise, bad things are going to happen. Then you have to move to controlling the space, which is, you know, the position and the posture. You want to control that distance between us, because that sets you up to move into some sort of dominant position where you can finish. And that's almost identical to what I'm going to do on the street. If, if whether you're a police officer approaching someone that's about to be arrested or you're being approached by someone that you don't know who they are and they just come up to you and they're trying to kind of, you know, bridge that gap between stranger talking to me and guy who gets close enough to rob me, there's going to be a point in time where you're going to have to go hands on. And when that happens, you need to have complete control of their hands. You can't let their hands disappear. If you're that arresting officer, you can't allow their hands, you can't lose sight of their hands. Uh, there's kind of a saying in law enforcement that their hands are what will kill you. And that's true because that's what, how people arm themselves. So you have to control the hands from the get-go. Just like in jiu-jitsu, I can't let a guy just have grips anywhere. Uh, I need to monitor his hands at all times um, to shut down his escapes as well as his offense. And in the street context, if a guy comes in to me, and attempts to put his hands on me or in any way, if I don't know this guy, I'm immediately going to monitor that hand. Maybe, you know, in a, in a kind of a cool way, remove it. You know, if he's trying to just, you know, do the old, you know, like put his hand on your shoulder or something like that. But at no time will I allow that guy to have his hand on me unattended. And then the next step would be, I'm going to control the space. So just like in jujitsu or fighting, the person that controls the space control or distance controls the fight, dictates the pace of the fight or the encounter. It's going to be the same thing on the street. If that guy moves up to my front to confront me head on or from the side, I'm always going to move to face him. And then I'm always going to be moving off to the side. I want to get to what we call the T right? So where his hips are here, my hips are here, so that I'm gradually working my way to his back. So if in jiu-jitsu, we're going to want to get to the back, if at all possible, right? Because I think you talked about it uh, in a really good piece. I can't remember where you did that. It was a, a seminar. I saw it on YouTube where you were talking about, because that's where I get all my training, and I saw it on YouTube where uh, you were talking about um, that a choke Rear naked choke is probably the most efficient, superior way to finish a fight. And it is. You know, you, there's a lot of people you could punch in the head and they're just going to look at you. But nobody can stop. Once that choke's locked in, they can't shake that off. So our goal is always going to be get, to get to the back to finish the fight with some sort of choke. And just a, it's similar with a street contact. Now, if we're talking about contact while we're still on our feet and we're still you know, using our verbal skills, I'm going to be maneuvering. So if this is my opponent's hips here facing me, I'm going to be maneuvering this way so that he's constantly turning. And what that does also is allows me to scan those surroundings, keep an eye on what's around me and see if he has friends. And also I'm working my way towards his back. If something does go wrong, it's going to be kind of hard for him to launch an, an offensive from facing backwards against the opponent to his back. It's going to be the same thing, just like it would do on the ground. If we do go hands-on in the street, I'm still going to have the same goals because if I can get to that T and then a duck under or get to his back, you know, arm drag and get to his back, 
he really can't launch an offensive. He can't use weapons eff effectively against me. I have better control over his balance and mobility when I'm locked on from behind, say like a body lock or something like that, right before I take him down or dump him or whatever I'm going to do with him. And then I'm also able to scan my surroundings a lot better when you have that position, which just coincidentally is a superior position in jujitsu. So there's a lot of things like that where there's so many similarities. There are far more similarities between what we do for sport and what we need to do for street than there are differences. And I think, yeah. you know, we've kind of maybe dropped the ball a little bit on arguing that point sometimes because it gets frustrating to say the same things over and over again. But then when you run into somebody who is intelligent, who trains, who does this stuff all the time, but then they have those same questions, that's when you realize, man, I probably should cover this uh, a little more often, you know, or maybe find a better way to express it because that's the thing. Like every time you do an arm drag from guard and move to the back, kind of that Hodger, signature Hodger move, you know, every time you do that, you just effectively shut down any kind of attack, weapon-based attack. Because how's the guy going to get you with a weapon once you're to his back? You can control the limbs, uh, do some sort of seat belt or harness, control that limb, lock it into his body, take his back, shut him down, get your hooks in, choke him completely out. You know, and those are the kind of things where I think there's so many similarities that it's it's a almost like this false um, argument. You know, if you think about it, like you know, our goals and and the street are going to be to control the hands because the hands are going to, how they're going to arm themselves, get to a better position, control that space and distance so that not only can I monitor their movement, I can keep an eye on their body's movements, get to a dominant position, which preferably would be the back, and then finish them. And then let's, so then now let's look at the street. You and I walk into the gym, touch hands, you know, we're going to roll a little bit and say, let's make it a competitive roll because Every time we've rolled before, I beat you, and you're real mad about it. And uh, so, <laughs> all right, so a man's allowed to have a dream. But um, so, you know, but say it's a competitive role. We're rolling for the same spot on competition team or something. Uh, I know, man, the best way to get there is I'm going to have to control your hands, not let you get grips, because if you get grips, you're going to choke me or throw me or set up position from – controlling your hands, I'm going to look to control the space and distance, dictate the pace of the fight, and then as soon as possible, get to that dominant position, which preferably would be your back, where you can't really do much with me once I'm on your back, and then I'm going to finish you. So those two separate worlds actually are very, very similar. There's more similarities than dissimilarities. Right. So we're always talking about how the delivery systems, the core root skills of fighting, the fundamentals, the things, not that's what most basic, but what's most important, are the same. And the epistemology, of course, is the same. The training method, how we develop skill in those fundamentals is the same. And the aliveness becomes even more important. But I've always said that the difference is going to be in uh, tactics. But really, what you're talking about is, is even at a tactical level, much many of the goals are, are the same. So, so the main thing that really is going to change from what you described there is, is the stakes. You know, it really is. It's, uh, it's, you know, Tom Gibbons, you know, one of the guys from, he runs Range Master, and um, he's got almost 100 students now that have been in armed confrontations. And he says all the time, it, it's not the odds, it's the stakes, right? So... It's the same thing with here. Like you were saying, you know, our, our tactics kind of remain the same. You know, everything's pretty much the same. It's just the stakes. So we have to ramp it up, maybe be a little more intense, kind of get out of that mindset of we're, we're just in the gym with one of our buddies. But again, I think that's going to be self-evident, right? Kind of like, you know, people say like, you know, am I going to get bad habits from shooting cardboard all the time, like on the shooting range? you know, what they call it square range habits. And I think if you can't tell the difference between a piece of cardboard and a real person, you know, with malevolent intent, then there's a lot of other things you have to work on before you get to that point 
But I think maybe too, I mean, what do you think? I think we talk about how the circumstances dictate strategy, and strategy dictates tactics, and then tactics control our techniques. So maybe maybe it's our strategy that's different. I, I don't know what you think about that, but I think maybe our strategy might be different because our strategy is going to be with a street thing. Our strategy is going to be to uh, extract ourselves from that situation as soon as possible. So right. my, my, maybe my strategy would be to stand up as soon as possible and get out of there. Whereas in a sport world, my strategy would be to maybe pace myself a little bit, you know, wait for a better opening, maybe look for a, a, a different position or something. Whereas my strategy in a street or self-defense context would be, I got to get out of here, you know, <laughs> so as soon as possible. And those are all things we work on, right? I mean, our foundations curriculum is based on pretty much guard game and foundations curriculum is based on three things, right? Which is uh, turning people over and techni uh, technical stand-up, you know, and that's pretty much the core root of a, found a good foundations program is you're, you're teaching your students to roll this guy over, get him off of you, and then stand up. And so I think, again, we're, we're kind of back to that. There's so many similarities there. It's really hard to find the dissimilarities. Everybody that's part of SBG and been around SBG for a long time knows who you are. But for our viewers who may not know you, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself real quick? Sure. So uh, I've been a part of SBG for – a few years now, I've been in law enforcement for 20, um, worked as a street cop. I've worked in SWAT, uh, narcotics, doing undercover stuff, um, training, all that good stuff. I've also been part of kind of the training business, working at a place called The Site, as well as on the road, working with another group called ShivWorks. And we teach kind of like the knife, gun, self-defense type stuff, as well as verbal strategies. And I've uh, been doing that for since about 2005. So a better part of, I guess, two decades now of training and coaching a lot of people all over the country and parts of the world to be a little more dangerous out there, making good people a little more dangerous. So when um, did you first come into SBG? 1999. 99, okay. Uh, 98. Was... No, actually 98. Yeah, 98. And it was through Lewis? Yeah. Yeah, Lewis. I was supposed to go down to Florida. Uh, he had you come down there. So we had talked. We read about you um, and the Straight Place Gym through Burt Richardson. So an article he had written, and uh, he talked about it. And I talked to Lewis, and we're like, hey, man, this is the stuff. You know, this is where we are. You know, we just didn't know that there were other people out there like us, you know, <laughs> free internet pretty much. And um, well, so then, yeah, I was supposed to go to Florida, and then some stuff came up with work, so I had to cancel the trip at the last minute. And then the second, I think Lewis talked to you or something. Somehow or another, we got you up uh, to Illinois a couple months later, which uh, you thoroughly enjoyed because I think you came up in, like, November. So it was, <laughs> it was <laughs> freezing. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you remember that. Uh, yeah, you got off the airplane wearing a hoodie, and I was yeah. like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is really fun. So, yeah. So, at the last camp, you taught a section on, on self-defense. And one of the things you said that I thought was, was great, and uh, a lot of the coaches in SBG can relate to, was the fact that you had gotten upset because one of your students, I think it might have even been a blue belt, came up to you yeah. and said they were thinking about training Krav Maga for self-defense. Yeah. And you want to tell that story real quick? Yeah. So um, he came up and he just said, hey, you know, uh, competed at a pretty high level in judo. Um, he's a he's an Olympic level type judo coach and uh, blue belt, very good jujitsu guy. And he felt like there was something missing. Um, he needed to plug some holes in his game so he'd be prepared for the street because he had never really thought about it before. And somebody brought it up to him that, hey, what would you do with a knife or what would you do with this or with that? And so he thought that maybe he needed to go outside of what we already did to kind of fill that gap, find maybe a solution for uh, this non-existent problem. 
you know, I mean, it's not non-existent, but you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's a solution looking for a problem. Right. And, you know, we've already, already figured it out. So that really got me thinking, I'm like, how can I be traveling all over the place, teaching people self-defense stuff, teaching people shooting and all that other stuff. And, and then guys right here in my own gym training with me every day feel like they're missing something. So that really, you know, I felt like I let them down. You know, that's what really made me start thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I think about that a lot too. And then I, I always recognize it's our responsibility and we have to tell the students and explain to the students, you know, what we've been talking about for years, decades really about, uh, and I always call it the street versus uh, sport fallacy. You know, when, when you and I are talking about self-defense and the street versus sport fallacy, we're talking about the training methods and the delivery system and the, and the major skill sets that we develop being the same. And I think they interpret that sometimes, or some people interpret that as the rule set. Yeah. And I think that, that um, a lot of times what we're talking about gets lost in translation. And you have a really good saying I love about, you know, not being able to beat us with the rules, but how would you... Uh, address that issue so that people understand better where we're coming from when we talk about street versus sport. Part of that, I think, is that, you know, for me as a coach is I just assume that guys that are training with me aren't involved in that kind of discussion. You know, like we've – because we've had that discussion since the old days of, like, the, the bulletin board type thing on the Internet where we just went at it with these guys over and over again – and so it's one of those things where you've had the discussion so many times, you just assume everybody knows, like it's a done deal, don't need to discuss it anymore. And yet, I think sometimes I've done a disservice to the guys that train with me because we actually do need to discuss it with them. So when I talk about it with them, what I try to explain to them is that, you know, the contrived training methods, like the, um, like the, the really bad acting, role-playing type stuff and that kind of thing, like that's not really necessary. You need to understand maybe a few things as far as maybe criminal or predator behavior. And then, but the rest of the stuff, the actual physical skills, we develop every day in the gym. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure if that really kind of answers the question, but, you know, I, I'm – so now I'm making a point to get across to my guys every time, like when – when we have our mat chats and when we talk about stuff, you know, kind of just hanging out a little bit in the gym and I try to express or get across to them that, Hey, you know, when you're dealing with a person with a weapon, the most important thing is to control that weapon bearing arm. And when we do arm drags and when we do back takes or we do any of this kind of stuff in here, what are we doing? We're monitoring hands and we're controlling hands and we're not letting them have their own like, thought process like they're not allowed to decide what to do with their hand we're going to decide and so that applies to a weapon if the guy has a knife or a gun or whatever it is I'm just not going to let him have that arm anymore like it's I'm going to control that as much as possible and so I think where I've kind of lost the ball a little bit with my guys and gals is that I didn't stress that enough through the years that like listen every time you do an arm drag to a two-on-one you just controlled a weapon bearing arm. Like if that guy had a knife in that hand or a gun or whatever it was, the second you took control of his arm, you took it off of you and you kept it off of you. That basically is all you needed to do in a self-defense situation at that moment. Yeah. And um, even with things like aliveness, you know, when I go to do a seminar somewhere, I'm making a point of talking about aliveness to that audience. And I take for granted, you know, sometimes that my own students know about that. But when I, the people I see every day for years, sometimes they may have never even heard that conversation because I'm not talking about it in my gym, you know. But um, let's get into some of the questions we got. And I think that'll answer and, and help uh, differentiate what we're talking about. And I kind of broke it down into three areas, uh, starting with the physical. So one... Real common question, and I like the way this was phrased by one of the students, which a question addressed to you was, How's, how does your BJJ hinder your street training? You know, that's the thing. I really don't think it does. Uh, because, again, I mean, if we look at the roots of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, I think Chris is the one that said, you know, it's Japanese in origin, and then, you know, it's modified by the Brazilians, and then the American influence of wrestling and 
all that stuff that came into play. Um, but if we look at the roots, right, like 13th century jujitsu, it's like every other culture. You see a guy with a pointy thing, you know, a sword or whatever, trying to shove it through another dude. And he's got wrist control and some sort of, you know, collar or something controlling that guy. So the roots of this art are very martial. You know, the roots of our art are very much based on a weapon. Um, Carlos Gracie's famous saying or ad, right? Like, if, what was it like? If you want your arm broke or your face beat in, you know, come on down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, the roots of this thing are very much a martial origin. So I don't think it hinders me at all because, you know, when we're rolling, when we're training, um, the kind of like the going inverted, the Ashi, the reverse daily Hiva, that kind of game is interesting to me at this point because it just is, you know, it's like another branch of the art. But when I'm training and when I'm training others, I'm constantly focusing on, on get on top and stay on top. If you're, if, you know, if you're playing guard, you're looking for a submission or reversal or to stand up. You know, we're not looking at anything where it's just, you know, I, I think it's just kind of a misrepresentation of the art mm -hmm. and uh, where people see two guys at a high level playing jujitsu versus jujitsu, you know, and they're forgetting that there's also this whole other side of the art that we've trained up to that point that was all about just being a better fighter, you yeah. know, everybody else. And then once we accomplished that, then we became more about, well, hey, you know, like, I know Matt's got this triangle that he can hit from, you know, the space station because he's six foot 20 or whatever it is. But it's like, so, so what do I, what am I going to do next time I encounter Matt or, you know, like pre, like, you know, you have all the guys over sitting there like, you know, Preet's got this weird thing he does. So I got a little something for him next time, you know, it becomes about jujitsu versus jujitsu. We're gaming each other, but that's not, our focus like right. if we walked out tonight and some dude jumped us we're not going to go hey now's the time to try that triangle thing that i've been trying to pull off on matt it would be let me knock this guy out or let me get up off the ground and get moving and right. i think sometimes guys forget that that's the roots are martial the roots are about fighting you know yeah. we're, we're never letting that go i mean from Day one, when they walk into a straight place gym, they learn self-defense curriculum almost. It's foundations, every every class in foundations is about how to fight. Right. You know, it's not about how to deal with a guy that can invert or how to deal with a guy that's got, you know, a killer, like, you know, leg lacing game. You know, it's about how do I fight somebody? And right. then later on, you know, down the road, you can figure all that stuff out when you want to compete and that. But... I don't, I don't know if that really answers the question. No, it does. And, you know, I was thinking, too, and as you well know, when you go back to all the um, very old grappling arts and every warrior culture around the world, European or Asian, has a grappling art. You know, Mongolian wrestling, Icelandic has glime, and they are all very, very similar, where it's a guy grabbing a hold of a particular grip. Oftentimes it's a belt because they have a weapon, weapons belt on, and then it's a hip toss or you know a leg trip because they want to be the first guy to get the other one down to stab him with the pointy thing you were talking about. It's a, it's a warrior art. Yeah, that's the thing. Grappling is just about, you know, it's got such a martial root, you know, and I think um, we've kind of allowed that conversation to be hijacked by yeah. guys that probably couldn't roll if you held a gun to their head. So, um, and it's hard. And so there's like that, it sounds bad, but there's kind of that disdain a little bit where it's like, you kind of feel like, why do I even want to have this conversation with this guy? He can't, like, we're not even on the same wavelength. And that, I know that sounds terribly like elitist, but there's kind of that aspect where it's, I have to, you know, like force myself to have this conversation, not for that guy, because I'm not going to change his mind but for the other people that are listening or watching. The sincere people, yeah. Yeah, the sincere people that are like, yeah, we're, we're, that is, like you said, you know, what about that? What is there something different that they do with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Or is there something that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu hinder them for the street? Like, is there a part? And I think there's a good, you know, um, Craig Douglas and those guys, the guys from Shipworks, they do, you know, we do this stuff where we'll give people two simunitions guns, put them in a car, and they have basically a fight in the car. It's kind of a worst case scenario, 
carjacking, whatever type thing. Things kind of went wrong, and he got hosed. His first, what we call evolution, kind of his first round, he got hosed by a guy that never should have been able to deal with him. And like, hey, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, well, you know, I, I, I really didn't know what to do. I mean, I've never had a guy hold a knife on me, so I didn't know what to do with that. Like, arm drag him, dude. Get on top of him, pin him down, and wreck him. You know, he's like, oh, yeah. You know, he, like, had this epiphany that just do what you always do, man. You know, you don't need to do something different. So I think there's kind of this disconnect. Like, they think now that there's a weapon involved, maybe I got to do something different. And once you explain that to them, once you tweak them just a little bit, like, okay, man, just focus your effort on that arm, that arm alone, shut that down, and then do everything else like you normally would. And once you do that, now all of a sudden you got a beast. I mean, now you got this guy who's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Arm drag, don't let him have that arm back. And just go treat it like a submission that you're not going to let go of, you know, and then on it. And all of a sudden these guys become beasts, you know? So, um, yeah, that, that's one of those things where it's like, it doesn't hinder me. It's just maybe sometimes people need just that little conversation or that little tweak where they see what we're doing is enough already. You know, you don't need something else, you know? And, and I think the challenge is getting that across to people. Yeah. I mean, we're using the same epistemology and that training method being the most important thing of all, always being the same, same, same delivery system. The tactics change a little bit, you know, and that's where you can have a conversation with somebody. And, and in regards to that specific question about doing a triangle with somebody with a knife, we're always, if it's a fight, you're always, the first thing you're looking for from guard bottom is control the person's hands, right? So, so that's part of what we do. And um, closed guard, I mean, closed guard is one of those things that locks that waistline down. Yeah. I mean, unless he's got the knife in hand already, he's got to go to where the knife would be stored on his person. And that's usually pockets, waistline, somewhere in there. So if I lock my guard game down on this guy, he's not getting anything out. And I'm controlling his hands. I just, I don't, I don't see it as a problem. And I think, like you said, it's, you know, the training methods – that cause us to want to control those hands, control that posture, make it so they can't move, make it so they can't access anything. Like I'm not going to let that guy's hands move around unattended. Mm -hmm. And I I think, but again, man, that's the thing. Like we cover that from almost like like the first two or three weeks in foundations, you know, where we work on guard and, you know, breaking people down and controlling their hands, not letting them just put their hands, post their hands on their face. In, in, the, in the sports side of it, in the sport aspect that we train every day, if you, you let me put my hands on you to post, then you know what's coming next. So you got to stop me from doing that. So it's the same thing for the street side. If we think street, then we're looking at if I let this guy put his hands anywhere he wants, then he's going to be able to access a tool. Yeah. yeah. Or punch me. You know, right. just as bad. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I've, I've changed with my own coaches here in the foundations class is make sure that they always explain that, you know, it's just one of those things that just a conversation might be enough, but this is why we're controlling hands from this position for somebody who maybe it's their first week, you know, in jujitsu. And then they'll start to understand, have a better understanding that what we're teaching is actually applicable for that self-defense. And they might not otherwise put that together. I'm kind of amazed sometimes that people who don't have direct experience doing what we do, and I don't even mean, you know, the years that we put in, but somebody that somebody with six months experience doing what we do has such a different view. And it was just to give you an example, I, I had uh, one of my friends brought me a, an academic paper. I forget where it was published, but it was an, actually a published academic paper about the dangers of sports jujitsu for self-defense. And the entire premise of the paper was predicated on the fact that if you learn to stop fighting when someone taps, then when someone taps in the street, you'll let go. And, and there was all kinds of citations in the paper for all these neurological reasons why that would happen. And I just thought to myself, man, this guy has never been in a gym when two people were mad at each other. The problem is not getting the guy to let go, you know? But that's just where just a tiny bit of experience could have come in handy, right? And without that experience, the mind can just go all these different places. And, you know, and the thing is with a lot of that stuff in the training world, so many of these kind of urban legends just 
grow and grow and grow and they go unchecked. You know, mm-hmm. nobody ever says, wait a second, that's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, like I've I've been in the gym before where, you know, guys get mad at each other and it gets especially competition, right? Competition team practice, guys get a little heated, you know, and guys don't want to let go. No. <laughs> no. And some, somebody's got to be the mom and walk over there and smack them in the head and go knock it off, man. You guys don't work together anymore tonight, you know? Yeah. But uh, it's one of those things where, you know, like the whole thing about, you know, uh, there, for the longest time, there was kind of this legend going around about gun disarms where this cop, you know, I'm sure you've heard it, right? The cop takes the gun away in practice, hands it back to his training oh, partner. Yeah, yeah. yeah, right? And I've heard that. Yeah, and then somebody said, yeah, and it happened in real life, you know, and the cop died. And I'm like, show me show me that one. Because, you know, they're all recorded. I mean, there's the Officer Down Memorial page that there's the FBI law enforcement officers killed or assaulted. All those things are documented and like endlessly studied. Show me where that happened. Oh, I can't find it. Oh, okay. You know, it's kind of like the legend of the martial arts master that, you know, was attacked in the street and the attacker crawled under a car, wouldn't come out to the cops showed up, right? Like that, every art has that. And so I think enough of that gets spread around and goes unchallenged. And then people just, even our people, you know, guys that train in our gyms are like, yeah, that's true, man. No, it's not. You know, but well, that's why we do podcasts. <laughs> yeah, right. That's the thing. You know, it's just one of those things where you look at it. You know, there's no way, man. There's no way. Yeah. Like, I mean, guys that train with us, training these in our gyms, training this environment, will still kind of be lulled in. Like you said, we forget that the guy that's only been doing this six months or a year, and this is the only environment he's ever been in. He's never heard like the aliveness discussion he's never like back when we started there was nothing out there like the vhs tapes maybe you right. know and that was it you know Beta. and so right and maybe a discussion on an internet forum somewhere where like you would write like a 500 word essay on what aliveness is you know and it's not around that much anymore i don't think yeah. or yeah. at least for our people that train with us that might not be there. And so maybe that's something we got to revisit. Go like, hey, man, you know, like, go read this or yeah. check this out. Check yeah. this out. Or maybe yeah. just Matt chat, you know. Yeah. yeah. So guys get it. But yeah. That's- Absolutely. Well, on the same vein, a lot of the other questions that, uh, you know, I could kind of sum up uh, as how do you train these uh, tactics? You know, how. I think uh, Coach Brian here, one of our MMA coaches here, phrased it pretty well. Where he said, "Can you talk about the differences between setting up a, a drill for, for example, uh, self def- specifically for self defense scenario, weapons or not, and uh, and what we'd normally do for MMA or jiu jitsu for self defense type stuff? Um, the way we set it up, it's kind of like we did it at the Portland gym. You know, I don't know if you remember how." we would have two people work together and then a third person kind of encroach. So you have that third person kind of come in that raises a little bit of awareness that causes the guy to kind of think about, okay, there's more than just this guy in front of me or a gal in front of me that I'm trying to deal with. I'm trying to deal with maybe a third party. Um, Somebody who's walking up could be just, you know, a do gooder that's going to try to make us stop fighting or it could be somebody who's involved in some way who's going to jump in and start lumping me up too. So I think if you put the focus again, like, you know, in foundations, what do we focus on in the first few weeks is standing up out of our own guard, a tactical stand up or a technical stand up. So I think if you structure some drills where you say, okay, listen, the goal for this drill is to stand up, you know, to, yeah, you get side control, but you want to stand up and get out of there, like unentangle yourself and get away safely or mount, unentangle and get out of there safely. I think that would be enough if mm-hmm. people just worked out a little bit just to kind of raise that awareness and then have that third person kind of circle with the intent of causing, like if you and I are working and you have mount and we have Zach or somebody kind of start walking from about 10 feet out towards you just so you remember, okay, there's a clock running, literally this person coming towards me, and I have to get up and away from this guy before that person gets to me. Like, that's a pretty easy drill to set up, pretty easy drill to work, 
And that causes people to start thinking about, okay, if this were a fight in the street, or, you know, like we used to call this animal environment, hey, uh, how do I get myself out of here? And then that would be an easy way to set it up. Yeah, excellent. Um, another version here of the question we received on the internet, how much time do you spend training those types of drills as uh, opposed to, you know, our regular delivery system training? I probably spend just maybe one day a week, maybe a couple of times, a couple of rounds. I just think about, okay, my goal this round is just to get away. My goal this round is just to make space and get away from this person. Or say this round, I'm going to, my whole goal is to stand up. My, my goal this, every time is to stand up. I'm going to bypass a, a submission. I'll bypass whatever, because I want to just stand up. You know, I might reverse them you know, turn them over and then stand up and get away. But yeah, usually I think once a week, once you understand it, once you kind of have it where you realize, okay, outside of the gym, my goal is to get away first. You know, once you kind of understand that, I think once a week is probably enough mm -hmm. to focus on that kind of thing. You know, just, just do a couple rounds where your goal is to just stay away. Your goal is to get up and get away. And uh, I think with everything else that we do, because um, if we're properly controlling side control or properly controlling mount, then our, our exit strategy is built in. Like we're always going to be able to, we're always going to be able to, to b bounce out of there, get all, away from this person. Because again, if I'm playing mount incorrectly, then that means they're tangling me up so they can turn me over. Mm -hmm. if I'm playing it correctly. I'm staying unentangled swimming off of them and I should be able to get off of them pretty quick. Yeah. So I think a couple rounds with that being the express purpose to get off of them is more than enough. Yeah. I think. Absolutely. You know, where the delivery systems, we always talk about the delivery systems transcend the environment. That's particularly true. I mean, it becomes even more true when you have an organization and series of gyms like ours, where our focus is almost always fundamentals. Because as you were talking about that, I was thinking, you know, nothing you were talking about doing would do anything but make your sport jujitsu and MMA game even better. Exactly. I mean, it's, they're, they're f foundational things for fighting in general. Yeah, exactly. So. It transcends it all. Because if I'm working side control correctly, I'm not allowing you to do what you need to do. I'm controlling the connection. Yeah. You know, I'm making it so you can't dig that underhook. You can't do all the things that you need to do to reverse me. I'm shutting it down. Those things are also making it so at any point I can pull the plug and get out of there. Yeah. Here's a question I got. I did a uh, podcast with Stephen Kesting the other day, and we were talking about, uh, he was asking how you would train, you know, for example, knife versus knife. I explained that that's not something we usually do, but it was usually defending against someone with a knife. But um, he also asked about guns, and I think that'd be an interesting question. His question was basically, how do you train firearms uh, using your aliveness methodology. You mean to defend against them or to develop a skill? I think he was talking about developing skill. Developing skill. All right. So basically what we do is, so we have an introduction fee where we, we take somebody and we actually um, kind of build their grip, build their stance and their um, what we call recoil management because you have to manage the way the the pistol is going to run or the rifle or shotgun. And then what we do is uh, we actually do that dry, what we call dry fire. So there would be no live firing. So that would be like the introduction and almost like the isolation phase where um, we focus intensely on what it takes to make accurate, fast hits. So that would be like your grip, your structure, your round of gun. So basically your connection to the gun almost, like jiu-jitsu. So, you know, we're going to put uh, pressure in the right spot to keep the gun from lifting. And, and then eventually we're going to progress into live fire to where we're able to run the gun accurately, fast and accurate. And then once we can run the gun fast and accurate, then we start building exercises or drills that test various aspects of keeping the gun up and running while running it very fast and very accurately. So, and then to test it, you know, obviously you just go to like USPSA, which is the United States uh, Practical Shooting Association, 
or in the, uh, International Defensive Pistol Association, something like that, or three gun, where you can test your skills in a competitive environment against other people and see how you see how you stack up. Excellent. Um, we got a few questions that were more uh, mental, emotional training, and, and one of them that came up was, when do you know, um, or when should you be ready for the circumstances to go physical? So somebody's involved in a self-defense situation, and it, and it's actually to the point where they need to go physical. What are the cues that would tell them that that was the, the appropriate time? I think some of that is built into us. Um, you know, as far as like the the predator prey type stuff. Um, you know, the thousands and thousands of years of evolution have kind of prepared us. And the problem is that we override that sometimes. Uh, we talk ourselves out of making a move. Um, I think if you wait until you're hit, you know, in the eyes of the law, it might be a little better to wait until you're hit. But realistically, I mean, how many hits can you take, you know, before something bad happens? Yeah. Um, is uh, that whole one uh, one punch homicide website where they just have – yeah. Just horrific stories of people getting hit and then their life being permanently changed. And so for me, I think there's a couple things we're going to look at, right? So any kind of, um, you know, any kind of movement with the hands, you know, towards the belt line, um, any kind of movement from the hands that's threatening uh, the feet, if they shift, you know, into what we were usually just call like a fighting posture. Like if there's a weight shift, um, you know, so folks talk about like grooming gestures and things like that. But I, I think, you know, the easiest way to remember is just the hands. If the hands start coming up, the, if the person keeps yeah. trying to creep their hands up, what do you, you know, you know what they're doing, but I think uh, uh, mentally, emotionally, man. Uh, so I guess I would have to know maybe what their kind of the basis of the question is. Like, are they asking, like, how to pull the trigger? Are they asking, like, how to predict something's going to happen? Yeah, no, I think you answered that pretty well. I think they're asking more, uh, you know, when when to actually go physical. And I think, you know, like you said, we have a lot of uh, evolutionary instincts that tell us that already. Yeah, don't, don't talk yourself out of it. If it's time to go, it's time to go. Like, don't sit there and try to reason with yourself. You can't have too many conversations going. You know, so they have the conversation going of, well, maybe this guy doesn't mean anything. Um, maybe this guy, you know, like stop the internal chatter, pay attention to what's going on. Um, I'm looking at like weight shifts, like did this guy shift his weight to the rear leg, like when people load up before they throw a shot. Uh, is this guy looking around? Is he trying to make contact with somebody else? Does that indicate that there's another party involved that you weren't aware of? Um, you got to, at some point, utilize that wide angle vision that we have, which is because of, you know, we can see out to the 180. Um, you're going to have to do that because as this person starts to do these things, that means there might be other people involved. And so now it's time to get, it's time to make your move, man. You can't. You can't wait until the third or fourth hit to realize you're in a fight. Yeah, and that kind of dovetails into some of the other questions that came in, which were basically about lawsuits and legality. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like you're saying, you know, if, if you don't have an option to get away and you, and you feel like this is the time to make your move, you don't want to start second-guessing yourself. Right. Yeah, that's the thing. And, you know, one, one of the best things to do is talk to an attorney ahead of time. Like, find an attorney in your area that's, uh, that specializes in uh, use of force law and um, that kind of thing, self-defense law, talk to them, get, get, you know, sit down with them, have a consultation ahead of time. Maybe even, you know, if you're in a position where you think you might someday have to get it on with somebody, like it might be worth the money for mm -hmm. a retainer or it might be worth the 250 bucks just mm -hmm. to sit down with this person and talk your way through What's going to happen? What should I be concerned about? All the questions that they might have as far as the legal side of the house goes, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that becomes like another barrier to action where you're going to sit here and not only are you second guessing this other person's purpose, like, are they really going to hit me? Are they really planning to hit me? Is this really happening? You have this internal chatter going on. 
but the last thing you want to do is sit here and go, well, if I do go, am I lawfully justified in making a move right now? Like you don't want to have that conversation at that moment. You would already know ahead of time, like, listen, you know, I have no way of escape, uh, multiple opponents, all these factors are in place. Um, I've tried everything to de-escalate. I've tried to avoid, you know, I've tried to deter and now I've got to act. And so it probably would be worth the time to just sit down with an attorney and have a conversation with them and just, you know, figure out what you can and cannot do mm -hmm. just to eliminate that opponent, mm -hmm. you know, that mental opponent. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel comfortable wanting to talk about this and we can, we're going to edit this. We can, you know, take stuff out or not leave it in, but I always find it uh, useful when you tell a story at seminars about when you were attacked by the gang members outside your house for a number of different reasons because you're talking about using the core skills that we train in the gym, you know, the delivery system and um, and what happened. Do you want to tell that story? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I was a resident officer, so that means I lived in a neighborhood that was judged to be at risk. And... Uh, I was inside, I was on the treadmill and uh, my first wife, um, mother of my kids, she came inside and said, hey, it's kind of icy outside. Do you mind, you know, getting uh, Mackenzie, my middle daughter, out of the car for me? And uh, it's no problem. And uh, I walk out there to get my daughter. And as I walk out, I see a gang member that I know I've had issues with. And he's kind of standing over there. And I thought, you know, again, talking about overriding instinct, right? So I see him and I think, well, that's kind of weird. You know, why is he standing there with these dogs? Then I see another guy going down this fence line. So if you can kind of picture like a uh, driveway with a fence and then my car, which was a minivan, the mom van, you know, is parked in the driveway with about a three or four foot wide gap between the house and the van. And then on the other side of the van is my squad car and, or police car and the fence that separates my neighbor's yard and my yard. And I see a guy who's also a gang member moving along the fence. And I think, well, what's he doing there? That's weird. And <laughs> talk about just ignoring, totally talking myself out of my instincts. And uh, I see him, you know, going down the fence line. Well, about that time I look up and, here we are. I'm getting my daughter out of the car and I look up and here's this gang member and it's on, you know? And so I put my daughter back into the van button to let the door shut. And we start scrapping, um, straight, strictly boxing, wrestling, that kind of thing. Um, nothing different than what I do every day. In the um, about that time, the guy that I had seen coming down the, or down the fence line, he came behind me. He actually was through the, the fence to get around behind me. He jumped on me. Um, we ended up, we're scrapping. Um, and it's funny when those things happen, you have like those moments where everything kind of just like freeze frames and you see like a, a push of something happen. And uh, it's kind of, it just strikes you as funny. Um, some guys were going up on my porch to go into the house. I guess their intent was to go after my wife or whatever. Um, and then the guy that was holding the dogs decides to turn the dogs loose on me. Their intent was for the dogs to go after me, but I think the dogs finally realized for the first time they were turned loose and all the people that were mean to them were like right there and I wasn't one of them. So, so the dogs went after the gang members. They actually ended up helping me, you know, and uh, they, they wrecked those dudes pretty good. So my last image as I'm fighting, I'm holding this guy down and I'm just beating him in the ear. And uh, I look up and I see the dogs chasing the guy that had turned him loose down the street. So that was kind of funny uh, in the middle of the scrap. But, yeah, I mean, multiple opponents on ice. It was wintertime, slippery. Um, I just used boxing, wrestling, jujitsu type stuff that we use every day to deal with uh, two opponents that were immediately on me. And then one guy that was coming at me pretty fast. I just hit him and then went back to dealing with this situation. But. Yeah, that was that was pretty hairy. But um, yeah, I, I again, that all that did really was just kind of cement in my mind that what we're doing is enough. You know, I didn't need any anything special, anything different than what I do every day. What do you think if you had to pick one or two things that really stand out to you <clears throat> with all your experience and um, 
in your job that people don't, smart people, don't still understand about uh, the kind of violence that goes on in inner cities like that? Man, I think they don't understand how fast it happens mm-hmm. and how low regard um, mm-hmm. some of these guys, the, the more, particularly the more violent guys, how little regard they have for anybody else's physical safety, feelings, whatever it is. Like, you know, people will say all the time, I can't believe this happened to me. I mean, that's like the most common thing, right? Um, is A, either I can't believe this happened or I knew something was going to happen. And uh, I think people just don't understand how little regard there is for life or physical safety, health, well-being, you know. I mean, it's nothing for a guy to, at a young age, hurt somebody, beat somebody severely. Um, You know, what we would call a heinous battery, which is like, you know, throw, throw, I'll give you an example. We had a guy who at a young age, just a young guy, um, he took, went into the bathroom, poured a uh, full thing of um, cooking oil into a a boiling pan or into a pan, turned it on, got it boiling, uh, walked into the next room and threw it on two of his friends um, that were sitting on the couch because they had uh, pissed him off. They made him mad about something and he thought it was funny. You know, he basically threw burning, scalding hot oil on the faces of two guys that he hangs out with over something petty, something that you and I would have just been like, hey, dude, what's your problem, man? Uh, Well, his answer, his way of saying what's your problem was to scar them for life, Hmm. you know. So I don't think most of America understands that kind of um, mentality, Hmm. you know, that they, they really don't care. And not only do they not care about what they, the act that they did, they don't care about doing time for it. You know, that's the other thing I think most of America and even other countries, you know, I don't think most people understand that these guys don't really care about doing time. Like it's not a big deal, you know, Um, whereas you and I, that would be a deterrent. You know, they're like, you know, the old joke is that there are people that are alive right now because I don't want to do time, you know, and, um, you know, and whereas there's another segment of society where that's not not a consideration. Like they don't care that they're going to do time. They care that they take care of business. Mm -hmm. You know, so you you stepped on their foot or you bumped them in the grocery store or you did something like that where you and I would be like, whatever, dude they're going to kind of have to deal with that. You know, they might, they might feel the need to take some really aggressive action. Maybe to us would be excessive, but in their world, that's just regulating somebody. That's just normal. And that needs to be done. Otherwise they're going to get pushed around. Once word gets out that somebody was able to step up to them, do something to them unanswered. They can't have that, man. Their, Their life's going to be miserable. They're going to be targeted by everybody else. So Doing time over like something like that, like throwing burning oil on somebody, doing time over that, it's no big deal. I mean, it's mm-hmm. necessary. If anything, it gives them more credibility. And how often is it over something petty? Almost always. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, what is the old saying? You know, it's always over uh, over uh, money and women, you know. And there's other ways of saying it, but that's the uh, the nice version. The nice version of it is money and women is young guys will kill each other. Over Status, something. Basically. Yeah, basically, yeah, something petty, man. They will go at it. You, yeah. you'll, have, you'll have guys that have a beef that goes back years over something that you or I wouldn't even be able to remember. Right. You're like, like, I don't even, I wouldn't remember something that happened with a girl in eighth grade, right. you know? <laughs> but these guys, man, yeah. That's something that still needs, if it hasn't been regulated, if it hasn't been made right, it's something's going to have to be dealt with eventually. And what's your advice when you run into, you know, a good kid that's trapped in that environment? So as far as how to get them out of there, mm-hmm. man, I'm, I'm working on that now. <laughs> so <laughs> um, after school programs, as cliche as it might mm-hmm. sound, uh, after school programs, having somebody who is willing to give that kid a shot at, at a better life, um, you know, sometimes 
you know, if, if you look, at, if you're in an environment where nobody in your household has ever had a job, where everybody in your household has gone to prison, um, then that's what's normal to you. And that's what's expected. And so you don't really see that happening, your life happening in any other way. Mm-hmm. Like, that's just what you see happening. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Dr. William April, I mean, I remember I, you took his class mm-hmm. in uh, Indiana, you mm-hmm. know, the unthinkable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how <clears throat> when you talk to young sir, young men, they will say, you know, from from these areas, they will say, you know, what are you going to do with your life? And they'll say, well, once I do my time, and you're like, what do you mean once you do? But they just accept that somewhere in here, I'm going to have to do time. Mm-hmm. Something's going to happen. It's just going to happen. And uh, that's, that's really sad, you know, to think about. But I think what needs to happen is we have to find a way to get these guys to see that there's another way to live. You know, it's almost like you have you have to take them from what's normal mm-hmm. and introduce them to another normal, mm-hmm. which is you can just go to school, you can get a job, you can, you know, do all these things that you don't think you can do because you've never seen anybody do it in your family, mm-hmm. you know, and it, um, and and so to take those guys uh, after school programs, uh, I'm working on. I still haven't put it together. Um, there's got to be a way to do it, though. Some sort of almost like Big Brother uh, jiu-jitsu program, you know, yeah. where guys – and I actually have guys in my gym mm-hmm. who want to sponsor people. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to think of a way to put it together because the kids that get picked for the program have mm-hmm. to know they're going to be held accountable. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a, it's a year commitment. Like, you don't get to quit. You don't get to, like, mm-hmm. right? You don't get to, people are paying for you to be here. You don't get to leave. Mm-hmm. You, you don't get to walk away. You're held accountable. You have to have grades. You have to be in the gym and be a productive member of our tribe. There's all these you know, expectations that where they're going to be held accountable. And I think that's the kind of thing these guys need. Mm-hmm. You know, they need something where, you know, they're accepted into a bigger tribe. Mm-hmm. They, they, uh, they become part of a bigger whole, but then they also understand you're a crucial part of mm-hmm. this whole, like, you know, um, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of times that's what the gangs give them mm-hmm. until they do time. And then they realize that's not all that it's cracked up to be. You know, when you talk to these guys and they go do time, they'll tell you that, you know, and when I worked uh, undercover, you know, I had the opportunity to work with guys who were informants, um, guys who were, you know, uh, trying to work off a case or work off, you know, reduce their sentence or whatever it was. And they'll tell you, guys that have done time will tell you, like, the gang will tell them, hey, you know, we're your family. Like, we got you, man. We're your family. We'll take care of you and all that until you do time. And then when you do time, like the first month, yeah, they they're they're up in your commissary. They're putting money on your on your books. Mm-hmm. They're coming to visit you. But about after that first month or two, it drops off, and they forget about you, and they go on with their life, and you're still doing time. Mm-hmm. And now you're just a dude, you know, trying to survive in this in this pit. So when those guys come out, they kind of have a different perspective on the whole group that they're a part of. A lot of times, they end up going back to it because they have nothing else. Um, but you know, that's a whole other issue. But if we could give them that tribe, if we could find a way to give them that inclusion, you know, and show them a better way and also show them that, hey, like, if you mess up, dude, you know, we're still going to be here for you. You know, we're still, you, you know, you don't get kicked out of the tribe, you know, once you're in it, you don't get to leave, you know. Mm-hmm. That's the, that's kind of the, you know, um, having a brain fade, you know, that knot, the mm-hmm. uh, end of the grape was supposed to have cut in half, you know, mm-hmm. that's the knot. Forty knot. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, how do we solve that knot? That's mm-hmm. the kind of the tangled up, jumbled up mess of generations of not seeing anything else but that. And how do we mm-hmm. show them a different way? And I really, man, not to sound like a, you know, like, like some sort of a religious fanatic, but I really think with jujitsu 
And with the programs we have in place, we could do that. Yeah, yeah I think we do. I think with them, and I mean, I did a, I did a podcast uh, with some other guys, uh, Grapplers Union, and I talked about that. Mm-hmm. And the response I got was, you just unbelievable. Yeah. You know, yeah. overwhelming. I had so many people just sending me messages on Facebook saying, "Hey, whenever you're ready, whenever you pick a kid, you let us know. We'll yeah. sponsor." Them. Yeah, you know, we'll 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 pay for their tuition. We'll pay for their uh, gym dues or whatever uh, we're going to do to try to rescue these guys. And and I, I I think that would be the way, man. I mean, if you want to make the world a better place, you know, like what's the old saying? Like we can't change the world, but if we change one person, we change mm-hmm. that person's world. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that would be the starting point yeah. to me. Yeah. That would be the starting point. Get these kids into something like this where they're going to be accepted. There's going to be expectations of them. They're going to be held accountable, but they're going to see uh, guys like you, guys like John Diggins, guys like Travis. You know, they're going to see other men, Mm. strong guys Mm. walking around the gym who are capable of great amounts of violence, but also capable of accepting them, caring for them, nurturing them, mentoring them, and helping them Mm. turn into upright Stand up citizens, you know, good mm-hmm. people, mm-hmm. you know, rather than mm-hmm. being in an environment where they see strong men that are capable of extreme violence, but they're not so good people. Yeah, I couldn't uh, couldn't agree with you more. Before we leave this topic, I just kind of always feel a little bit obligated to talk about how prevalent uh, it is that the victims of violent crime, especially, you know victims that aren't necessarily people who live in the high crime neighborhoods know uh, the person that is committing the violence, even though it's the same in the inner cities. I almost always know the person. And one of the statistics that blew me away was the fact that um, step parents are a hundred times more likely to be uh, abusive to children than um, biological parents. And that's kind of worldwide when you look at the statistics. And, and course you have people that will immediately get mad and say well I had a great stepmom and yeah my wife's a great stepmom I'm not talking about an individual but just generally speaking just in general and um, what do you say or what would you say to you know uh, a young woman who's maybe not in the best relationship with a boyfriend or other people who have these characters in their life who are probably going to victimize them but they haven't gotten to that point yet and they need to figure figure that out and then be assertive and, and draw a line before it actually turns into something physical where jujitsu would have to be used. What what advice would you give to people like that as far as what they need to do? Yeah, that's a tough one because we know that there's a, there's almost like a, mm-hmm. a, a number of times things have to happen before people finally reach their kind of rock bottom. Mm-hmm. You know? emotionally or mentally where they go enough you know and and get out of there uh man that's tough i for people who aren't to that point where it's gotten physical or or become physical rather they need to begin to assert their voice like they be they begin they need to begin to take their place in that relationship and that's so hard to do without outside counseling or outside intervention where you have people who are outside of them who can tell them because again we have the situation where to them that's normal you know maybe they grew up seeing this like you know they grew up with this is just how things are and and if they're in you know i have, we've we've dealt with particularly when i was a resident officer um i worked with the crisis center a lot because i had daily interactions with you know, neighbors and people in the, in the area, we, um, we would find that sometimes, you know, these people would find, they would think, almost think that um, it's, it's, if it's not chaotic, if it's not violent, it's not normal, like something's wrong. So they almost needed that, you know, to make them feel like everything's the way it should be. And so that's a, that's a tough topic to tackle. I think really, you know, if they are in the gym, if they are, you know, attending a straight place gym or they're a member of the gym, um, having people around them mm-hmm. who are kind of normalized 
you know, I think is a big step in the right direction because they start to see how other people interact, see other relationships and understand that one, um, whatever it is they're dealing with is not normal. And two, once they develop this greater level of confidence, they'll also start to realize, well, I deserve to have that too. Mm -hmm. I deserve to have a normal relationship. Um, you know, this kind of weird, toxic, violent situation mm -hmm. isn't normal. Mm -hmm. So what do I have to do to get there? You know, which might mean leaving, might mean having to actually mm -hmm. use the jiu-jitsu, yeah. you know, if that makes sense. But, yeah, I think that's kind of, oh, man, that's a tough one. That is such a tough one because you need that outside mm -hmm. intervention mm -hmm. at some point where they realize, you know, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I don't deserve this. You know, I, I, I need mm -hmm. something different. Mm -hmm. I have to have something better. You know, a lot of times yeah. it comes when they have kids. Yeah. You know, if the offender moves, makes a move towards the kids, then that's when they realize, you know, speaking mm -hmm. from like a female perspective, mm -hmm. that's when they kind of realize I've got to do something or he's going to do to them, to my kids, what he does to me. Mm -hmm. So I've got to take a stand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's where that'll come in. That's actually a really good example because you know, so often I think people who may not be familiar with the data or have had a job like yours think that the primary threat to children, and you know, we both have kids, I've got little kids, so that's, you can't imagine a worse nightmare, but you think it's some stranger that's going to pull up in a van and take the kids, and, and 90 whatever percent of the time it's mom's boyfriend or an uncle or somebody, you know, that, that was, that's known to the family. And uh, it's yeah. somebody who's known and and man, it's just it's so scary. And, and you know, we, we kind of due to the news or media or whatever mm -hmm. it is or movies, you know, we we kind of always expect this, you know, van candy van, the stranger mm -hmm. and you candy know, van. yeah, right. You know, and uh, and when in reality, it's the yeah. it's mom's, you know, new boyfriend or yeah. whatever, and like you said, you know, even in animal kingdom, you know. You know what, what? What do animals do as soon as they come in and they kill off? Yeah. You know their predecessors' children. You know yeah. they they want their genes to pass on, not the other guys. Right. And um, I think maybe at an evolutionary level, maybe that's kind of what's happening there. Um, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where I think education, uh, talking about it. You know, when we do our self defense seminars through the gym, you know, talking about that kind of stuff with people. Um, getting people aware of it i think that's a big step in the right direction yeah 100 percent. so we got a few other spare questions here i'll just throw out your way one was um what do you advise for people as it relates to self-defense for for individuals who might be much older or injured or handicapped i think for for some of the folks like that um probably the easiest answer is some sort of in conjunction with a good coach who can work with them, you know, to, you know, like when we did the thing, we did a thing with uh, veterans, guys that were in wheelchairs and stuff. Uh, amazingly, a lot of that, a lot of the clinch work, uh, you know, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. works really well because in order to mm -hmm. abuse someone or hurt someone in a wheelchair, you got to do one of two things, either knock them out of the wheelchair. So now you're on the ground. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. grab them. And when you grab them, they can grab you. And so we worked on a lot of that kind of stuff. And then uh, a pepper spray, kind of uh, one of like the Saber Red, that's a really good pepper spray. That kind of stuff will at least give them time to get away. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's kind of like you load that guy up with pepper and then get out of there. You know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Uh, for the older folks, you know, my mom, she has to walk her dog it's a 10 pound dog so it's not technically a dog but it's a dog <laughs> she's got a, it's an old, it's an old lady dog right yeah. so she's got to walk walk her dog every day twice a day and i make sure that she has her saber red pepper spray with her mm -hmm. you know she's just you know, she she's done the women's self-defense program she's done that kind of stuff but she's one of those people that says you know she's not going to fight mm -hmm. somebody so what, what advice would I give my mom? Walk with the pepper spray in your hand. And if you have for a moment, if someone approaches you, has no reason to talk to you, you don't know them, you don't need to be nice to them, 
<laughs> you can pepper spray them. I mean, if they start to work, right? If yeah. they start to do something, they start to try to grab you or do something, pepper spray them and then get out of there. Mm-hmm. Get moving. Um, and that pepper spray is going to mm-hmm. wreck them. It's pretty, pretty potent. The saber red stuff's really bad. Uh, so mm-hmm. that would be my recommendation. Just some sort of, you know, normal jujitsu, but with a with a competent coach. That I mean, if they're in a straight place gym, I'm, I have no concerns. But if they're not in a straight place gym, um, or one of our coaches, it they need to be with somebody who's competent. I mean, as nicely as I can say it. Mm-hmm. So they need to be with somebody who's going to take mm-hmm. into consideration, like, hey, this person doesn't have full use of their arm or doesn't have full use of the leg or, or has maybe half their spine is fused. I have a guy that trains here that's got a cage and rods in his spine and all that stuff. And that, that, that sometimes taxes my full 25 years of coaching mm-hmm. to try to mm-hmm. find ways to make things work for him. But that's where you, you need a competent coach. They, those folks need a competent coach that can work with whatever challenges are presented, give them a workable plan set them up with pepper spray or whatever it might be so that they have a plan to deal with more than one while they get out of there. Yeah. yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I had a woman come in a couple of years ago who had called me and she said she had been consistently um, molested on the street, guys coming over and just grabbing her. And one guy had pushed her out of her wheelchair. And so I had her come in and just get on the mat and told her I wanted to see how she moved to make sure she could get in and out of the chair by herself. And I'd tell her what she could do or couldn't do. And she had very limited movement. And I, I, don't, I was afraid she wouldn't even be able to hold a, uh, a gun or maybe even pepper spray. And my recommendation to her was a, was a dog, to get a service dog. But what surprised me at first was, I think it had been in the course of 12 months, she said she'd been attacked four or five times. And I thought, man, you know, that's so unusual. And this is Portland. But then I realized she's just a magnet for those guys. So, you know, they just see her. And if she's any, if somebody like that sees her, then they're going to go over and get her, which is sad. But I hope she got a dog. Well, you remember the study, um, William April talks about it with the gate studies and all that, Mm -hmm. where, Mm -hmm. you know, these guys on Rikers Island could, with greater than 50% accuracy, pick people who had been victimized before. Mm-hmm. Like they could watch people, watch their sign language or body language rather, and just knew like that's a good target. And it was always people who had been victimized before. So that just something about them was attracting that that predator, mm-hmm. you know, that, that guy that's looking and he could pick them out. And so again, I mean, it comes back to a little bit of what we do every day is actually the best answer for that because you know, when you see somebody who's been training jujitsu, they've been in here and they've been through the mill, so to speak, of changing themselves, evolving into this person that's better at jujitsu, they start to carry themselves a little different. And that might be just enough to make that predator go, never mind, I'll pick somebody else. You know, I'll wait. Kind of like that lion sitting up on the rock, right? Mm -hmm. The lion that's sitting on the rock isn't the lion that's the bravest. Because the bravest sign is the one that's like, hey, look at that elephant. That's a good challenge. And he gets killed. You know, it's it's the line that's smart enough to go, I'll pass on the elephant. But the baby elephant, as soon as he's unattended, I'm going to kill it and eat it. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. And so if they can have just enough of a change in their gait, in their posture, the way they carry themselves, that might be just enough to get them deselected in the future. So yeah. sometimes, man... What's the, I don't know if it was um, Kano that said it, uh, the way is in training. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is the way, you know, if they just get in here and do what they can with a competent coach working within their challenges and the abilities that they have that they can present, changes their confidence level, changes how they carry themselves, and all of a sudden they're not selected anymore. Absolutely. And we also got a couple of questions. I don't know why you and I are getting these questions. I'm going to be saying something, something about, you know, know how, how do you train, train when you're over 40 or 50 it was phrased nicely also by uh one of the other the coaches, other coaches that said, said when you know when you more, know more can we do can do less do. what would you say about that i have no experience with that. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so that's a good question so um i mean you're in a better place to answer that than me but 
um, from my little from the little time I've spent at being over forty. Um, I think, you know, I think you told me um, you get, you got to pick your roles. When I was recovering, you know, and still recovering to some degree, you have to pick your roles, and you also have to understand that maybe you can't mm-hmm. take as many hits as you once could. Mm-hmm. So um, I can't remember. I, Adam Singer was telling me about it. There's a study on fighters and how that once they're knocked out, a few times they become more susceptible to the knockout. Right. And that's also kind of in part explains how, you know how you'll see a fighter particularly boxers. Like I remember watching Ali fight Leon Spinks mm-hmm. I remember watching that fight. And you remember how you saw Ali suddenly become an old man mm-hmm. just in the ring, just all of a sudden he wasn't Ali anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, so kind of the, the way, I think the way Adam expressed it, and I'm going to botch it cause I'm not as smart as him was that after that first knockout, your expiration counter starts, like your timer starts. And from that point on, it's just a matter of a countdown until you're done. You can't fight anymore. And so for older guys, you know, first off, I think most older guys aren't going to get in fights on the street. It's just not going to happen <laughs> unless you're mentally deranged. Um, most older guys are kind of past that point where, you know, they, they feel like they can't let something slide. So there's a little more mature. I know things that I would have got out of my car and fought about at a traffic light when I was 20. Now I just think that's ridiculous when I see two other 20 year old guys do it. You know, I'm like, first off, you guys, I should give them my business card. They can't fight. And then two, you know, like, that's just dumb. What are you doing, man? You know? So, but I think within that, I think you kind of have to start kind of structuring your game towards what you're capable of now and just accept that. Just go look, pick and choose your roles. You know, I'm not going to go roll with the with the guy that I just saw rolling spastically and trying to pull heel hooks in an explosive manner. Like, that's not going to be a dude I'm going to roll with. Um, but at the same time, you know, I want to have at least enough knowledge about how to deal with that guy, mm-hmm. you know, to still, if I had to deal with him. Um, but yeah. And I think a lot of it too, here's the other side of that. Um, find a, a good chiropractor, a good massage therapist, maybe a good uh, physical therapist and make recovery at, make your recovery as active and as intense as your training efforts. And, and drugs. Lots, lots of drugs. Lots, lots of good drugs, drugs man. Yeah. Lots, of, lots of those cookies. But I had to um, I had to do that. You know, I had to really – I wish I would have listened when I was younger. I remember I went to a um, seminar with a guy named John Perillo, who is a powerlifting coach and a bodybuilding coach. Um, just – he was just creating monsters. And I went to a seminar with him when I was in my 20s. And he said in the seminar, um, if you're an athlete and you want to do whatever it is that you're doing, your sport, into your later years, you need to now approach diet and recovery as intensely as you do training. Mm-hmm. And he, he actually used the example of guys have training journals, but they don't have in their training journal, they don't have recovery. Like there's no column for what did I do to recover? And so particularly once you turn 40 and, you know, 40 into 50 and on, you really have to start making recovery the focus. So if you want to keep doing this stuff, you know, like um, as much as it pains me to say it, like yoga and that kind of stuff, (laughs) like you have to make that a priority too. Like that has to be as much a part of what you do every day. Uh, Staying hydrated. You know, we know that just a little bit of dehydration can have significant impact on recovery abilities and stuff. So, and you know, uh, your flexibility and all that. So yeah, unfortunately at a certain point you can't just, you know, stay out all night till two o'clock in the morning drinking and, you know, strip clubbing it and then show up at eight o'clock for fight practice and, you know, train all day and then go to work 
and then uh, come back the next that night at six and do it again and then go out and party again like that. Those days are gone, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I think, though, at the same time, though, I don't think you have to totally wuss out. Like, I think no. in, if you take an active approach to recovery, I think you'd be all right. Yeah. I think sometimes, not, not with these guys, because these questions came from, from, you know, people that do what we do, but sometimes, especially in the context of self-defense, when I hear this question, it's people implying that, well, that's, that's great for self-defense if you're a young man. But what, what are you going to do for self-defense when you're 50 or 60? And I always just remind people, you know, you're just not really thinking too clearly because if there was a magical martial art that worked at 50 or 60, I'd use it too when I was 20. So Yeah, so look at uh, Jack Dempsey. I mean, Jack yeah, Dempsey yeah. wrecked those dudes when they tried to mug him. You know, yeah. he's 80 years old or whatever. Yeah, you know, and he I don't want to try and rob Foreman. Yeah, exactly. Could you imagine, yeah. you know? And, uh, I mean, you're going to get hurt bad. That's going to be the worst day of anybody's mm -hmm. life, trying to mug that guy or roll that guy. Um, with limitations, uh, physical limitations, age, whatever, I still look at it like if they're going to try to run your pocket, if they're going to kill you, they're going to kill you. Like they're not going to walk up on you and put a gun on your, on your, to your head and all that stuff. Like that might be eventually what happens. Mm -hmm. But once they're within arm's length, like you're a grappler, man. You've got decades of grappling in your system, hardwired in at that point. You're going to wreck this guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you, you know, like you don't have to do it like the intensity that you're about to hit this guy with, say, self defense, right? So, we're talking strictly self defense, 60 year old guy, like a guy your age. So, <laughs> so a guy your age. So, some cat comes up and puts a knife on you or tries to run your pockets or something. You've got 15 seconds of hell to unleash on this guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's all you're going to need. You're not, we're not talking about doing this every day at that level of intensity, but can you, can you tap into that intensity for that long? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you wreck that guy? Like take him places he's never been, you know, like what is that, uh, that Prefontaine quote about, I'm going to take you places you've never been. Yeah. You know, in this race. Yeah. You're going to take that guy places he's never been, man. And he's going to get wrecked. And you know, yeah, he's violent, and he's probably been violent his whole life. Most felons committed their first felony before they were 11. Yeah. So, yeah, he's probably been violent his whole life, but not against the guy that's skilled, not against the guy that's got 30, 40 years of this kind of training under his belt. So for the older guys, I would just say, look, man, keep training the way you train. Train in a way that you can train consistently without injury. Train around whatever injuries you have. Um, and then – but. In that moment, when you need to go intense, you know, hit the nitrous yeah. and go intense, man. Yeah. Wreck it. Yeah. And then, but don't concern yourself that this is something you have to do all the time. Yeah. It's something you're going to need for about 10 seconds. Yeah. The second that guy gets within arm's length, wreck him, and then, and then go put ice yourself. <laughs> go put ice on everything that's sore, you know, and uh, that's it. That, yeah. I don't. I mean, not to trivialize, you know, kind of like downplay the importance of the question because I, you know, like you said, if they're coming from the self-defense perspective, I get it. I see what the concern is. I understand their concern. Mm -hmm. But I think it's it's one of those things where, like you said, it's kind of that fallacy. Mm -hmm. Like, they don't need to operate that intensity like a 20-year-old guy, you know, that's just banging away for an hour, you know, yep. five-minute rounds with no break. Yep. They don't need that intensity. They need – they need that intensity for 10 seconds. Right. When I get that question from, you know, people in the organization or people at seminars and people that do what we do, almost every time I think it comes down to a question of identity. And that's part of the trip, right? So you, we're young athletes and we're, comp, we're in comp team and we're being competitive with the fighters. And then you start to get a little bit older in jujitsu, and I, and I remind those guys at a certain age, you know, certainly at your age, in, in your 60s, you're never going to be able to win the Mundial, right? But even, no, realistically, even at 40, you're not going to win the Mundial. So if you can beat every black belt, every one of your black belts on your mat, all that tells me is that you're incapable of creating a world champion. Because if you had anybody that was capable of meddling as a world champion that you've created on your mat, they'd be beating you every time. You know what I mean? You might fend them off for a while, but eventually they're going to tap you out. So as a, as a coach, you're, you, you have to be creating people who can beat you. 
or you can't be, you can't create these champions. And that's just part of, you know, every answer you've given, which has been great, but ultimately the big picture perspective, and I, as I say this, not that it matters, but as you know, I'm an, I'm an atheist, but we keep coming back to uh, community. And I think these are, these are positive things that people would get from a good church or a good group like that, where you're around people who you can help you navigate uh, changing identity as you age. And in a good organization, good gym, we have to do the same thing, you know? You know, yeah. that book where it's like we create a community that fills all those voids that a church usually would. You yeah. Know? yeah. And, you know, not to get too far into that because I don't want to alienate anybody that no. does, but, you know, because that's, I, it just is what it is. But, you know, those, those places, those uh, communities, they do fill that. You yeah. know, they have a place for, the the person that's no longer like the 20 year old go-getter you know like that's even in, in an employment you know like on a job if you're not that hard charging 20 or 30 year old salesman anymore you're kind of put out like mm -hmm. you know they they don't st they don't send you you know the good leads anymore because they know you're not going to do do go at it as hard as you once did or whereas that would never happen in a church or a community like that. And right. same with our, our organization, like, you know, we're not putting you out to pasture yet. You know, we're still going to keep you around. But, you know, despite Travis's votes that you should probably be <laughs> aged out of the boom play. No but, no, but I mean, in all seriousness, how valuable is it for young fighters to have somebody old like Adam on the mat as a coach? You know, he, the amount of wisdom that, that our coaches have, you know, his place, even if, even if all of a sudden we could give him all the attributes and ability of a 23-year-old athlete, he'd still be better serving the entire team by being a pair of eyes on the outside of the, of the environment, you know. So, so there's a role for everybody there. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think, you know, as far as that kind of stuff, like you said, man, they just, I think it's just the, it's an identity thing. Um, and part of that, uncertainty i know i went through it you know uh with some of the health issues where it's like man where am i gonna fit in everything now like am i still good to go <laughs> like you know like if something happens am i gonna be all right like am i gonna be able to take care of myself and and i i think you know for me like all the stuff i just said about you know you just need that explosion or that skill or whatever it is you just need all that stuff to come together for a few moments yeah you know and i i think that was kind of the self-talk i had with myself at a certain point where it's like listen you know i don't know if i'll ever get back to what i had at one point but i do know that if i had to i could perform yeah. at a high enough level to, to be okay um, and I don't know that I'd want to perform at that level every yeah. day. You well, listen, know, you've been really generous with your time, so let, let's end time. it. Let me ask yeah. you one more question. Um, you know, I've I've studied quite a bit for other stuff that I'm writing. Some of the some of the data and statistics as it relates to uh, police violence, and I I wrote an essay about it. Um, and we don't need to get into all that, but there are legitimate cases that you see that come up where officers have uh, behaved inappropriately or, or responded the wrong way. That definitely happens. Uh, it's usually not the ones that the media jumps on and it's certainly not in the in the volume and narrative that they have, but, but we do see them on occasion with the dash cams and everything else. And given that, and given all your years of experience, if you had to pick one or two things that are most needed as far as uh, law enforcement training for uh, to, to help minimize these types of incidents, what would it be? You know, like the overly simplistic answer would be, um, these guys need to be punched in the mouth. You know, they need to, like, they need to be hit and realize they'll be okay. Like, not overreact, not come, like, go straight to 100. You know, just realize, okay, man, got it. This guy's fighting. I'm good to go. I'm going to lock him up, wrap him up, and just maybe hang on, wait for backup to get there. Um, but yeah, I think that, that would be probably the number one thing I would want to do is 
Um, you want to inoculate them to physical contact. Yeah, the stress, the contact, to realize that because what happens is you get guys who haven't been hit. You get guys and gals who really probably haven't been in a fist fight in their life. And that's not an insult. You know, that's probably because they were raised to be good people, mm-hmm. you know, so they really didn't get into scraps. They didn't get into trouble. And so the first time they get into a situation or they encounter a level of aggression that can sometimes happen, yeah. they freak. Yeah. You know, they, they lose it and they go way over the top. And I really wish there was a way that we could kind of move all the liability concerns off the table, maybe ask the lawyers to step out of the room for a second and let guys just get in there and get into a little bit of a tussle in the, in the police academy or in the in-house academy where they're being trained mm-hmm. so that they realize, okay, man, I'll be all right. I can, I can take a hit. If I have good jujitsu, just even, you know, a couple, like a two or three stripe white belt level jujitsu, they'd be really, they'd be good to go. Yeah. I mean, I really wish, you know, I have a friend that says that uh, he thinks the the answer to all the police use of force incidents across the country would be that by the time they graduate from the academy, they're required to have a blue belt. Like you have to have a blue belt, you can't go on the street. And if that motivation were there, guys would find a way because it's it's a it's a good profession to be in. Um, they would if that motivation was there, like we probably would never see again any kind of um, yeah any of the ugly, I guess, use of force cases that we see where yeah. guys are beating people, hitting people with things, shooting people that don't need to be shot, um, tasering people. You know, I mean, taser use is pretty up there right now um it used to be pepper spray not taser you know um because that's the tool you know now the in tool um and i think if we had guys that were closer to a blue belt level if we had officers that were and again going back to that change in demeanor right, right. so a blue belt's going to walk around with a lot more confidence than a guy who has no training has never been hit right you know? i think a lot of times if you had a guy with that kind of confidence show up on a call, it would never get to that point anyway. Yeah. You know, it would never go there because these guys are going to know, right? Going back to that conversation about knowing this isn't a, this isn't an officer I want to try. You know, so I think if guys, you know, officer walk in there with blue, blue belt or higher level confidence, man, most of this stuff probably wouldn't even happen. Right. I mean, obviously it's just, you know, you know, throwing it out there. I don't have a crystal ball, but just from my experience and from what I've observed, uh, I think that would that would solve a lot of the problems. Right. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Well, listen, somebody who wants to come train with you, where do they go? So we're in Elgin. So we're at 1341 Manor Court in Elgin, Illinois. And 60123 is the zip code if they GPS us. They can find us there. You did just open up a full-time gym. And you've been open now, what, a month? Yeah, we've been open about a month and a half now. Awesome. And how's it going? It's going pretty good, man. It's going really well. We've got a great group of people here. Um, it's growing. We get people signing up pretty much uh, weekly, if not daily. Right. And uh, we've got a good group, man. I'm really enjoying it. You know, a lot of white belts. We've got a couple blue belts, three, three blue belts, two purple belts, a brown belt, and me. Brilliant. Yeah, so then we got, you know, a slew of white belts, and uh, it's just – it's a great group, man. I'm, I'm awesome. Awesome. I couldn't be happier. Very cool. Listen, Paul, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, Thank and, you. Uh, Thanks for having me on. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure I'm we'll sure get we'll some get questions. Some. And um, we'll do this another time. And uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
this is SBG, you'll be okay.